Have you ever been sitting there and you enjoy the first song, you enjoy the welcome, you enjoy the music, and then you go, man, I hope this sermon's good. And then you think, you're the one giving it. So that, ah, that, I love that song. It, it reminds me of Psalms 46, um, where it says, God is our refuge and strength, the helper who is always found in times of trouble. And the rest of the psalm goes on to talk about even when the earth is falling apart. God is always found in times of trouble, in the highlands, in the heartache, all the same. He is the same God. Amen? Amen. All right, well, we are going to be finishing our series in Philippians today called Humble Unity and Partnership. And we've talked a lot about uh, Paul and, and seeing uh, hum humility through him, our ultimate example of humility in Christ. We talked about humility and conflict, how we develop humility. We talked about examples of Epaphroditus and Timothy and humility. And, and we're going to finish it out today of talking about how do we in this room partner? How do we partner in humble unity? What does that look like for us? And so we're going to be in uh, Philippians 4. 10 through 20, and hey, I discovered these little books. I have my Bible up here. You always have your Bible in case you need something else, but these little books, I got the passage on this side, a place to write over here, and I was getting ready to practice this morning, and I was like, I have no notes in my Bible, so I'm carrying this book around. You guys should invest in some of these. These things are great. Anyways, moving on. That's just one sales pitch. Probably I got it at Lifeway. Anyways, go ahead. Um, there's a story, though, that I, I read this week. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, two authors uh, became good friends. And they developed or formed a kind of impromptu, random uh, group of other authors of the time. And they, they formed it and they called it the Inklings. And I'd never heard of this before, but what they would do is they would gather, they would bring something that they were working on, and they would read it to each other. And then, you know, as friends do, they would critique it. They would help each other. They would, they would refine it. They'd discuss it. And uh, the two founding members of this group were C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. And two of the liter literary um, works that came out of this was the Chronicles of Narnia and the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And what I loved about that story is you see this group of authors, these two guys who are masters of, of just liter of literature, they come together to work with each other, to partner with each other, and out of that partnership came two literary masterpieces that we still celebrate today, that movies have been made out of, that, that everybody's reading, and, and it's just, it came out of that partnership from that group. And that's the type of partnership we're gonna look in the church today. How do we create masterpieces with each other in here. All right, so let's turn to Philippians chapter four, verses 10 through 20. I'm gonna read it here. I rejoice in the Lord greatly because once again, you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you, Philippians, know that, the er that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need several times." Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am, very, I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. This is, this is God's word. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, let's jump in at the beginning here. I got, I got three points uh, that I want you to catch today. Um, but as we look at the first few verses, I want you to remember, he is talking about a gift that he has received. In chapter two, we talked about Epaphroditus, who was a messenger from the Philippian church. They, they took a collection for Paul. They gave it to Epaphroditus. He traveled from Philippi to Rome, and he delivered the gift to Paul who is in a Roman prison. So the gift that he is talking about here, that's the, that's where, that's the same one. He's received it and he is giving a thank you. 
right? Paul is thanking the Philippian church for the gift that they had sent to him. And he says, you know, once again, he's thanking them because they renewed his care for him. You know, for a while, they didn't have an opportunity. They didn't know what to do. And I think some of that was geographic. Paul was a long way off in Rome. You know, they're all the way over here in Philippi. And I think when they heard Paul was in prison, they said, okay, this is a tangible need that we can do something about. Epaphroditus, take this collection, take this money, go to Rome and help Paul and stay there and serve him. So even though they didn't, they, at a time they didn't know what to do, they eventually figured it out and they renewed their care for him. And in verse 14, Paul says, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. He is complimenting them. He's saying, you did a great job. He's giving them, he's, he's thanking them. He's, he's telling them what a great job they did. And then we see in, in verse 15 and 16, Paul actually reminds them that, that, you know, I see, he says, what I see in you is a regular caring for me. You guys have always been there for me. Verse 15, he says, and you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, which is the region where Philippi is, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Paul says, I remember that in that time, you were the church that sent money. You were the church that supported me. Nobody else did, but you did. And in fact, the next verse, he says, you sent gifts several times. So Paul is thanking the Philippians for these gifts that they're sending him. And he's saying, you're doing a good job at this. You're doing a good job at partnering with me in the gospel. And, and, and I would say this, here's the first point. Strong partnerships are built upon sacrifice. Strong partnerships are built upon sacrifice. What I mean by that is these Philippians, they took up a collection, they gave money. Epaphroditus took time off work for a long time, right? And we talked about how he even got sick and almost died on the way. He laid his life on the line, not just socially and vocationally, but even with his physical health. These people sacrificed in order to help Paul. And Paul's saying, you know, you've done a good job at this. And even later, he even describes it as sacrifice. He says, your giving is a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Paul's saying, your gift was great. You did a good job. And partnerships are built upon sacrifice. It's similar to um, the movie, and I'm sure a lot of you in here have seen the movie um, Schindler's List where this guy named Oskar Schindler, a German, goes uh, to an area in Europe and he's going to become wealthy. That's his initial goal. But as he sees the abuse of the Nazis with the Jews, he changes his goal and he begins to use his wealth to save 1,100 Jews. And he works hard to keep these 1,100 Jews safe in his factories and trying to keep the nicest way. He spends a lot of money on bribes. He bribes officials to leave him alone. And these 1,100 Jews survive the war because of Schindler. Now, what's interesting about him is, is uh, two things. One, after the war, he did not have a successful business venture. He was bankrupt. He spent all his money on saving these Jews and then afterwards, he never had a successful business venture. He laid his financial life on the line to help these people, to partner with them for their survival. Not only that, he laid his life on the line because at any point, the Nazis and the Gestapo could have stormed in and arrested him and, and, and hung him for treason, hung him because they didn't like what he was doing. But he put his life on the line to save these people. He partnered with them to survive. That's what, that's what, partnerships are about. They're about sacrifice. If you want to have a strong partnership, you have to be willing to sacrifice. So you have to ask yourself, when was the last time you sacrificed for a friend? When was the last time you gave up your time or your money? When's that you gave up a resource? You let somebody borrow your lawnmower. Let somebody borrow, you know, a, a tool of, some, of something. Took the tool over there and helped them do the job. Strong partnerships are built upon sacrifice. And I'm gonna hammer this home. Many of you are sitting here going, oh, I'm willing to do that, but I just don't know where to, where to how, do, how do you do that? How, how do I find out needs? And, and I don't want a ton of you running up after me after this sermon saying, Matt, we would like a list of everybody has needs. We wanna form partnerships. No, 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 that's not how it's gonna work. First of all, there's a lot of you and there's one of me. Second, if you want to form strong partnerships where you can serve people, you can sacrifice for them, you need to be in a grow group. You need to be in a grow group. Our grow groups are the smaller groups of the church where you sit and you study God's word, but also you share life. 
In a grow group is where you hear somebody talk about work saying, man, I'm really struggling with this. Or you hear about their health needs. Man, I'm, I, my family or I'm sick in this way. That's where you begin to hear from other people what they're struggling with, what, they're, what, what there is in their life is going on. And then you can say, okay, this is somebody I can sacrifice to help. And vice versa. When you're in a grow group and you start going through a hard time, you get other people here and that's where they will sacrifice to serve you and to help you. And that's where partnerships are formed. You can't just come here on Sunday and sit in here and expect partnerships just to develop. You gotta work at it. But working at it takes sacrifice. But put yourself in a position where you can find people to form those partnerships with. That's in grow groups. And you go to the next steps uh, desk right outside these doors. They'll help you find one either on Sunday or during the week. But that's where you can go. And I'm gonna hit this again and again and again because as I thought about how do we form partnerships here, it's in grow groups. That's the tool we have. And it works if you embrace it. Let's keep going. All right, so in verses 11 through 13, what we have here is Paul, he shifts from talking with the pronoun you to the Philippians to the pronoun I. And listen to this. He says, I don't say this. I don't, I don't say thank you. I don't rejoice over your gift, uh, over your care for me. He says, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know, to make, I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. And any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And this leads us into the next point. Paul is saying like, look, I am thankful for your gift, but I want you to know that my hope doesn't rest upon your ability to give me gifts. He says, he's looking at these flipping Christians whom he loves, who he's thankful for caring for him, but he wants them to know, you are not the ultimate person I have hope in. He says, my hope is in somewhere else. He says, it's not the Philippians that provide for all his need. It says, I am able to do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. Paul, th- Paul is saying, even with the gift you've given me, of which I'm so thankful for, I want you to know my hope rests in Christ. It doesn't rest in you. Because one day, Philippians you may not be able to send a gift in time. You may not be able to send enough to take care of me, and that's okay, because my hope is in Christ, and Christ gives me what I need for the circumstances that I'm in. And, and I, want to, I want to focus here, it's strong partnerships are built upon Christ. Strong partnerships are built upon Christ. They're not built upon each other, Right? If we wanna have relationships with each other, it's not just you and I, it's you and I in Christ. Because one day, you're gonna let me down. One day, I'm gonna let you down. You wanna know why? Because I'm a human. I'm not perfect. I'm not all powerful. Someday, I may let you down because I make a mistake and I sin. Some days, I may let you down just because I'm not God and I can't be anywhere at all times, right? You would say, man, I needed you. I'm sorry, I'm in California, right? It's like, I can't be there. So we let each other down. And in a funny way, if you base relationships upon human systems and upon humans, things, things just don't go always well. And, and they break down. And, and there's a story of this family that goes to another country and they're in a country they don't speak the language and they're staying with a host family. And the host family has been very kind, very generous. And so they want to buy them a gift before they leave. So they said, you know what? Let's go to the store and let's get some preservatives, some you know, jams and jellies and things like that. And that'll be the gift we give them. So they go to the store and they ask, you know, can you help us find the preservatives? We'd like to give a gift. And even though the store owner seemed to look confused, uh, he helped them by finding what they need and he packaged it all up and he wrapped it up for them and they took it and they gave it to the host family. The host family opens it up and with a really confused look on their face says, thank you? What the family didn't know is that in the country they were in, the language, the word preservative means pickles. So they had bought a bunch of pickles for their host. And the host was like, thanks, I guess, right? The host was trying to figure out what's going on. And the people were trying to figure out what's going on because they just wanted to buy a nice gift and they bought them a bunch of pickles, all right? And so when we rely on human systems like that, they break down. The people that were giving the gift had good intents, right? They wanted to give a kind gift to people who had been kind to them, but it broke down, right? It's kind of a funny story, but that happens in relationships with us. 
right? I try to help you. I'm doing the best I can, but however I'm helping you, you might actually be like, Matt, it'd actually be more help if you wouldn't help, right? You know, actually, when you said that, it hurt. And I was like, oh, I was trying to be encouraging, right? You know, like we do things like that. It breaks down because we're imperfect. That's why we don't put our hope in the partnerships. We put our hope in Christ. And on that hope of Christ, we build the partnerships. So partnerships are built on sacrifice and partnerships are built on Christ. And again, the place that we find ways to make partnerships with each other is in grow groups. But one way to make sure that you are, you're building on Christ is through your daily time with the Lord. Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you focusing your mind on Christ? I was listening to a spot, so I was on vacation last week and, and throughout vacation, I just, I, I listen to music. You know, you're, you're going around in the morning before the kid's up or when you're on your own and, and I'm listening to music. And you know what, I woke up this morning and I was raring to go on this sermon, but what was playing through my mind was some of those songs. Nothing bad, I wouldn't listen to anything inappropriate, but it hit me again how often what we listen to, where we put our mind on a regular basis is what is the backdrop of your mind. Is Christ the backdrop of your mind? Is he your subconscious thoughts? If you're not reading your Bible, if you're not praying, he will not be. That's just fact. I'm not making that up. I'm not trying to be blunt and, and abrasive. I just, it's true. Because the only way we can keep Christ in our mind is to dwell on the words he's given us. And that's the Bible. That's through prayer. So if you want to build your relationships on Christ, if you want to build your partnerships on Christ, be in God's word regularly. If you wanna, if you wanna have strong partnerships built, uh, you have, they have to be built upon sacrifice. That's where you need to be in a grow group. If you want a strong partnership built on Christ, then that's where you need to be in the word and in a grow group. Now let's move on to the third one. The third one here. If we um, go to verse 10, and I debate on whether or not I start with this because it's the first verse or not, but I think this is, uh, I wanted to end with this, this third point here because it kind of explains the whole passage building on the other two. And this is verse 10, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again, you renewed your care for me. Partnerships are built on sacrifice. Partnerships are built on Christ and partnerships are built on finding joy in others. The word for joy here is the main verb for this whole section. Everything comes back for that. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. And then after that, the next two paragraphs are all explaining why he has joy. And not just a little, but greatly. That word for greatly is actually in Greek, megas, where we get our word mega from, right? Mega, large, huge, big. And it's actually a ranking system. Paul is saying, my joy is ranked so high because it is so important for you. It's one of the greatest joys I have is that you guys you guys sent a gift to me. You renewed your concern for me. And if you drop down to 17, he says, um, verse 17 says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. Paul is not rejoicing over the gift they sent. Paul is rejoicing over the hearts of the Philippians, how they cared for him. He said, I'm, I'm not seeking the gift. It's not that you are closer to God and more successful in your walk with him because you're able to give this gift. He's saying, no, I am excited. I am, I am, am rejoicing for you because the gift shows where your heart is and it's profitable for you and it increases to your account. Those three words are all actually financial words. And, and profit, profit can actually be translated fruit. And he's saying, you, by participating in the ministry that I'm doing, will bear fruit. And I'm not saying financial fruit. Paul's imagining when he goes to heaven and when the Philippians go to heaven and God stands there and they're coming up to him and he, God's gonna look at them and say, Paul, you are faithful in your ministry. Well done, good and faithful servants. Here's the fruit. And Paul was on the front lines. He saw the fruit. God's gonna look at the Philippians and he's gonna say, Philippians, you gave to this ministry. And when you gave to this ministry, that allowed Paul to proclaim the gospel. So the fruit that was born through his ministry, I put on your account as well. Come in, well done, good and faithful servants. You know, it's, I don't have time to tell you the whole story of everything Jersey has done in missions, 
Pastor John probably could. But I do know three stories where we have supported missionaries and God has done great things through them. One is in Southeast Asia. This gentleman went into a country with less than 1% Christian. And after being there for a very long time, it's 3% Christian. Now you say, Matt, that's just 2% of a country of 20 million people. I'm not good enough at math to figure that out right now of what 3% of 20 million is, but it's a lot. One guy that Jersey supported. We have another uh, couple, a family in Germany and they, uh, we've just started supporting them. And as I was talking to them, they are ministering to Ukrainian refugees because the Ukrainians are coming from Ukraine because of the war into Germany. And they had a house. They never imagined they'd do this, but their house is filled with like 60 Ukrainians now. And of the students, they had like a, a summer camp for them and 16 came to know Christ. Jersey supports them. We have another family that was actually in Russia when the war started. They have moved to Lithuania and they are proclaiming the gospel in Lithuania on the front lines of everything that's happening in the world. We support them. When this church walks into heaven, God's gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. You supported these people on the front lines and everybody that accepted Christ, everybody that grew in Christ there, I put on your tab as well. That's the blessing. That's the blessing of what this church has done in missions. And it's what Paul is talking about. And Paul finds joy in that. Strong partnerships are built upon the joy of others. He's saying, look, I, Philippians, I recognize that you have sacrificed and given me a gift and God is gonna not bless you in the sense of give you money back, but bless you in the sense of getting to participate in what he's doing around the world. We need to find joy in each other not just in what God is doing through our financial gift overseas, but let's find joy in each other here. And you know what that means? That means we need to pray for each other. Lord, thank you so much for that person who stood strong in the midst of a tough time. Thank you for that person who no matter what seems to happen, they always just seem to be ready to share the gospel. Lord, thank you for that person who just seems to be maturing in their faith. And then you know what, after you thank God for them, tell that person, say, hey, I just love how you're ready to share the faith. I, I just love how you study your Bible. I just love seeing you mature in Christ, right? When we start speaking those words of encouragement and we start finding joy and seeing what God's doing through other people, encouragement happens and friendships form. As I was writing the sermon, I was reminded of a, a time when I was in sixth grade. It's a little embarrassing, but stick with me. Um, I played basketball one season in my life, one season and one season alone. And I started out on the A team and I ended on the low end of the B team. Um, and, uh, and as I was playing, we played eight or nine games and we won one night and I was in the locker room, I was furious. I was angry, I'm pecking my stuff up, gritting my teeth and I'm getting out of there. And the, my coach grabs me by the arm on the way out and he goes, Matt, what's the matter? I said, coach, it's been eight games. I'm on the B team now and I haven't scored a single point. And he said, Matt, I think it's gonna be okay. I think he knew my, my basketball career was going to be very short. Um, but you can imagine as a sixth grade boy playing sports, you want to be the star. It didn't matter that my team won. It didn't matter that everybody else was doing all right. It mattered, I wanted to be the star. I wanted to score the points. I wanted to be the one that everybody saw. That's not finding joy in others. That's being a bad teammate, right? So as you start thinking about finding joy in others, repeat this to yourself. Don't be sixth grade Matt Reed, right? When you start to get grumpy, when you start to look at other people and be frustrated, don't be sixth grade Matt Reed. Start looking for what God's doing in their life. And you can feel free to say that. Don't be sixth grade Matt Reed. Some of you might be saying, I don't wanna be Matt Reed anytime, but that's okay, that's another story. Um, but find joy in others. Don't be focused on yourself and your own success. Find joy in others. And the way to do that, guys, is in a grow group where you sit with people and you know them well enough to know what they're going through and to know how they're handling it, to see where they were and now to see where they are. See, we can't just do that in this room. 
We can't build relationships just in this room. Being in here is important. Worshiping as a body is important. A collective voice of worship, going up to God, hearing a a regular proclamation of God's word is important in your life. It helps with the backdrop that we've talked about. But if you want to build strong friendships, if you want to build strong partnerships in the ministry here, you need, they're built on sacrifice, they're built on Christ, and they're built on finding joy in others. And the best place to find that is in a grow group. It's in a grow group. And so as we, as we, as we kind of walk through this passage and we see that there's one challenge that I wanna give you. None of those three things are possible. None of those three things are possible until you make the decision in your heart that you wanna follow the Lord. Because what can happen is you can come in on Sunday morning, you can sit in these chairs, you can do the regular, hi, how you doing? Good, I'm fine, thanks. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm fine, thanks. You might even know, be able to see people from this church in the gas station. You might even know some of their names. Oh yeah, they sit two or three seats in front of us at church, they sit over here. But if you remain there, what you're gonna find is that you're comfortable with surface relationships. And some of you in here are going, yes, I am. Yes, I am, right? Stick with me. If we remain here, I'm not saying you have to go into a growth group and right away share everything that you've ever thought that's going down in your life. But if you remain here and you don't take any steps to go deeper, this is what happens. When tragedy strikes in your life, the tragedies that I have seen in this church where the church is able to step in and surround people and comfort them and love them, the ones that are always the best are people who were involved in the church prior to the tragedy. Those who are not, those who are not connected in the church, those who are not in a grow group, those who are just coming on Sunday mornings, guys, honestly, those are the people I hear about their tragedy six to eight months down the road because you don't know anybody. And there's a lot of you and a few, of, a few on staff, but you wanna know where we hear the most news about how you guys are doing? It's through your grow group leaders. If one of you is in the hospital, your grow group leaders, bam, they're texting us, they're emailing us saying, did you know so-and-so is in the hospital? Did you know so-and-so had a baby? Did you know so-and-so's uh, marriage is struggling? Did you know, boom, boom, boom. And they're not, sorry, that was last one maybe, they're not sharing secrets, they're not sharing secrets, but they're sharing things about you so that we know how to care for you. And when you're in a community like that of people who care about you, they care for you and then they let the pastors know. So then we can care however is needed. But those who aren't connected and they just somewhere in here on a Sunday morning and they never take that step into a grow group, you get frustrated with people like me. I understand that. You're frustrated that I didn't show up at the hospital for your surgery. You're frustrated that I wasn't there when your child was struggling. And the truth is it's because I didn't know not because I didn't want to. But you wanna know how I find out? I find out from your grow group leader. I find out from your friends because you're connected with people at a deeper level where people love you and they wanna partner with you. They wanna sacrifice to help you. They wanna find joy in you. They wanna have a relationship with you that's built on Christ. You need to find that, but you've gotta make the decision. I can't make the decision for you. The church can't make the decision for you. You've gotta make the decision for yourself. So the question really is, if you want to build relationships where you can sacrifice for somebody else, where you can have a relationship in Christ with them, where you can find joy in them, you've gotta make the decision to follow Jesus. You've gotta make the decision to go deeper in your relationships. What's the passage where two or three are gathered in my name? There I am. When you join that grow group, Christ is with you and he's drawing you and the group closer. When you you are taking your relationships to a deeper level with other believers, that's where you will find growth and maturity in your walk with the Lord. Growth and maturity in your walk with the Lord. But you have to want it. So the question I want you to leave today is, do you want it? Do you want it? And it's okay even to say, as you pray, as we close and as you pray, say, Lord, I want to want it. Maybe right now you're sitting there going, I know I got things in my life I want more, but Lord, I want to want you more. That's a safe prayer. 
But some of you are sitting there going, you've been in this church for maybe 20 years and you have yet to darken the door of a grow group. You need to get in a grow group because that's where you'll find relationships that will be with you all the days of your life and will help you follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray over this group here today, wisdom. Wisdom to know where they're at with you. Wisdom to know what's the next step for them and finding relationships where they can partner with people in life and draw closer to you. Lord, I want that for everybody in here because I know how important relationships have been for me and keeping me close to Christ. And Lord, I want that for everybody here that they would never, never know what it's like to be outside the church, but to have the church wrap their arms around them. But Lord, I know it's their choice. So Holy Spirit, speak to anyone in this room. Speak to everyone in this room about what their next steps are. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.